So today I want to talk about how we do Vue at GitLab. This is more of a story, less on the technical details, more on the storytelling here. So first I want to introduce myself. My name is uh, Jacob Schatz. I am a staff developer at GitLab, and I had the really awesome opportunity of becoming the first front-end developer at GitLab. When we didn't have a front-end engineering department, I came in and started building that. So what is GitLab? GitLab is an open source, web-based um, Git repository manager, but it's so much more than that. And GitLab has a bunch of different views, and I'm gonna show you some of the things that I typically use on an everyday basis. So this is the uh, repository view where you can see your files, and our syntax highlighting is really awesome. And here we're just looking at an individual file. You have your issues where you come up with ideas. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, where you come up with ideas and you uh, post bug reports, all that sorts of stuff. And then when you actually write the code, you have merge requests um, where they, the uh, code can be approved. I spend most of my time in here because I'm often reviewing tons and tons of code. And then we have our built-in CI and CD where uh, the tests run on GitLab.com itself or you can host GitLab yourself. So let me tell you about the problem that we had on the front end. When I first joined GitLab, uh, the JavaScript was written on an as-needed basis. So there was a lot of inline JavaScript styles, uh, a lot of uh, global variables, a bunch of stuff like that. And you can also see that there's Ruby that's written uh, inline, because you can do that. Uh, so you have JavaScript in Haml mixed with Ruby, and this is around December uh, 2015. So JavaScript was written on an as-needed basis. Rails uh, has this really magical thing called remote true, uh, where you write your form, and then it kind of Ajaxifies your form for you, which is really great. It does this uh, data remote equals true. The problem is <laughs> you don't really understand how this is happening. And if you're doing anything more than just a simple uh, CRUD application, then you gotta go a little deeper. Also, the JavaScript that you write is injected back into the page and then evaluated um, with eval. It's actually this really uh, uh, deep in the catacombs of jQuery, there's this eval function that it has, which is a little different than JavaScript's eval, um, which replaces the script tag which uh, does some extra stuff for you. Uh, but this can be a, a problem. And the other thing was that we had big plans. We had really big plans for GitLab. Here's a, an example of our um, issue boards, which is similar to uh, Trello, where you can drag and drop issues, and uh, you can kind of plan out your entire milestone through this with labels and everything's updating automatically. So while you could do this with the existing way of doing things, it would probably be a really bad idea. It's not gonna be maintainable for the long term. It's not something that you can scale. You wind up with that spaghetti code situation and then doing things like updating the DOM automatically. jQuery has its show and its hide and then the text and all that stuff. And so let me first, before we get into the view, talk about GitLab's modus operandum, our MO, the way we do things. We go with boring solutions. That means that you can get things done really quickly if you don't go complex right away and you just go really, really easy right to start off with. And we go for the minimum viable change. That means that you're going to take the smallest iteration to get the job done. And this is how we're able to ship things so quickly is because we just take a small iteration on an idea, the smallest iteration that's possible. And then we also have this thing called manager of one, which is where everybody is very self-sufficient. And so in a typical week, I may only talk to uh, one of my reports once during the week, because they know exactly what they need to do, I know exactly what I need to do, and everybody kind of just gets their job done. So everybody is very self-sufficient. So we needed a framework that would work for us, something that would work with the way that we do things, our MO. And we also needed a framework in general because this uh, sort of way of writing things in the Rails 
uh, way wasn't going to work long term for the big plans that we had. So here's what we needed. What we needed was a framework that was going to make it easy to contribute. GitLab is open source. And so we need other contributors who have never seen a framework before. Maybe they don't know that framework. Can they pick it up really quickly? Are they going to be able to just go in there and write code? We need it to be fast to learn, something that people can pick up quickly. The concepts should work on their own, meaning that the individual concepts of the framework can be applied and you can be immediately productive without knowing the entire framework as a whole. And we wanted something that wasn't absolutely gargantuan. So why not choose React? Super popular. Everybody was doing it. Uh, Mithril is really cool. Eight kilobytes, 56 kilobytes when it's not minified. That's 206 uh, difference between view. What were those 206 kilobytes doing? You know, why did you even need those 206 kilobytes? Couldn't be that important. So the truth is, is that when you choose a framework, there's probably no wrong answers. It's not like you're doing the wrong thing by choosing a framework. But for us, Vue was the easiest choice. Vue had the smallest learning curve while maintaining the largest functionality. And those two things were really, really important for us. Vue was also drop-in. At the time, we didn't have NPM. We didn't have Webpack. And so the asset pipeline in Rails allows you to just drop something in there. It's just like adding a script tag. And Vue just worked in that situation. And so we could iterate quickly. So in our discussion on the front end team when we were talking about this, we agreed that a lot of the frameworks were too big, too overtaking. And we wanted something that was small and simple. And so we took a look at Vue. Um, I had originally taken a look at Vue at around 0 0.6, version 0 0.6, and I just tried making a really big application in it. Because that's always your test. It's like all of these frameworks work, but when it comes to the complexity and the scale that you're going to be working on later down the road, which is hard to judge in the beginning, will it work? Will it be complex? Will you get confused? What will happen? And it was just easy straight from the beginning. So this main concept of like these eight lines of code, I think it's eight, yep, eight lines of code. If you understand these eight lines of code where you have your, you're basically attaching it to a DOM element, you know, this div uh, with the idea of app, and then you have some data and that message can change and it automatically updates. This idea on its own presents a really small initial learning curve. And people who adopt Vue, who have never learned it before, can already be productive with this small amount of code. And that's really, really important for us, uh, that people can be, a pro be productive immediately, because it goes with our small iteration. And as a lowest common denominator, what will it take for someone to get up and running? There's definitely more concepts to Vue. And when those concepts are introduced, there's not a whole lot that's introduced. These concepts can go in very small blocks and people can adopt them really quickly. So this is some of the reasons. So let me just talk about a couple other reasons. For us, Vue was both opinionated and non-opinionated. When we adopt something, we're not going to immediately make up a whole huge rule book. We need to adopt it quickly and just start writing it. So when I say opinionated and not opinionated, Vue has this whole ecosystem. There's these problems that are solvable. They're like, you're going to run into this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem and you're going to be able to solve it with these tools. So you have Vuex, you have Vue Router, you have the Vue Style Guide. But on the other hand, if you want to just write Vue straight without any of those things, it still works perfectly well. So let me talk a little bit about our release cycle here. And this is one of the reasons that we have to iterate so quickly, is that new features are scheduled in advance, usually two months in advance, and we release on the 22nd of every month, no matter what. It's not like something didn't make it in, oh, we'll go on the 20, no. 22nd, no matter what. And all the code has to be in review by the first, and it has to be merged by the seventh of the month. And so this is a very short amount of time to write code. And it also allows us the opportunity to write the code, and when it goes in on the seventh, we have the seventh to the 22nd, for anything that could come up, people can start writing their new code for the next month, 
And so this is a very tight deadline. So there's really no time to waste. There's no time to refactor everything. So sometimes I've seen it where companies say, oh, we're going to introduce this new framework and we're going to rewrite everything. We don't do that. We can't rewrite everything. There's just no time to rewrite everything. So when we went to go add in view, we had a couple of things we had to take care of first. We had baggage. So Rails comes with, at the time at least, it came with jQuery and CoffeeScript. Rails comes with CoffeeScript, and we wanted to remove CoffeeScript. And you might be saying, why did you want to remove CoffeeScript? So CoffeeScript, if anybody doesn't know, is it's a solution to some of the problems that ES5 kind of presents. You've got uh, a class syntax where you can create classes really easily. And while you can do this in ES5, the prototypal type stuff is more complicated for people to wrap their head around. And they could write this really, really easily. But ES6 came along, and it took notes, and it solved all these problems. And a lot of the people that we were talking to were already writing ES6. They already knew it, so we didn't really need a CoffeeScript. And there was no need for a non-standard language. And it was hard to find people to write CoffeeScript in the first place. Most people that we talked to didn't want to write CoffeeScript, and the contributors didn't want to write CoffeeScript. So as soon as we switched over, we immediately got more contributors. And most devs were already good at JavaScript. So the first step was for us to remove CoffeeScript. And CoffeeScript compiles to ES5. And so we used a little uh, magical incantation like that. And uh, we took the source that it compiled, and it, we got the ES5 out of it. And then we slowly compiled it. We slowly rewrote that to ES6. So here's our label manager in CoffeeScript. And this is what it output. And you can see that that's not the, uh, the nicest thing in the world to look at. It's got all these uh, ternary things and all these nulls and refs ones, refs twos. So what we did is after we did it, after we did the compilation, and we just said, this is our source now. The one really cool thing about that is that all of our tests passed right from the get-go. Of course they did, because it was the same source code. Um, it looked a little ugly. So we went in and we fixed all the ugly parts. Now, you normally don't see this code, right? Because this is the stuff that it compiles to. Uh, and again, once we did this, people started contributing more. And then we were able to add in Webpack. And so once we added in Webpack, then we were able to take the kind of ugly ES5 that CoffeeScript generated and write ES6. And we did this on an as-needed basis. Because the thing is, is that we're going for boring solutions here. Our tests are already passing. Although some of that code doesn't look great, it works, and we need to write new features. So only when we came to that code and we were interacting with it, then did we actually change the code. And then you can see it turned into a much more beautiful situation. And so rewrite everything? No, that's a horrible, <laughs> that's a horrible idea. You know, a lot of people sometimes come up to you and they're like, okay, we got this framework, it's going to be awesome, let's rewrite it. Don't do that. It's not a good idea because you need progressive enhancement. We wanted to deliver the new code in parallel with the new features, which is a tricky thing to do. And so then what about Vue? How does it fit into all of this? Again, progressive enhancement, small steps, small iterations. We need to start simple and get complex later. So what was the simplest step? Start with view in these .js files, and then we can go to the .view files later. So here's an example of a typical component that we would look at. I'll let it scroll, because it's hard to read it while it's scrolling. But the most important part is at the bottom, you see your template you've got there. It's a multi-line template. It's a multi-line string. And so multi-line strings are great. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good solution. Has several problems. Syntax highlighting, you can get a plugin for one of your editors, and that'll work fine. But GitLab's not syntax highlighting that. So when people are going to review that code, they have to look at that unhighlighted code, and it's a, it's a problem. Also, the performance. This is not, uh, this has to be compiled. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extra step in there. So add in view loader. Once we added in view loader, we got a huge performance boost. There was uh, Phil, uh, one of the developers on our team, noticed that one, this one button component that we had was taking six seconds to compile, which is ridiculous. It's a button. What, what was it doing? Um, 
What could it have possibly been doing? Nobody knows. Um, and, but for smaller pages, you might not have noticed the difference, but it's like your credit card statement. It's those little things that add up into the bigger, uh, into the bigger amount of time. So it was a huge performance boost once we switched over to ViewLoader because of this compilation uh, issue. So the outcomes. Our life was easier because we had less bugs. And we had less bugs because we wrote less code. When you write less code, you have potentially less bugs. And we had a bunch of other little things, like one of the things is event management. So um, Rails comes with this thing called Turbolinks. And Turbolinks kind of takes your page and says, the next page only has this little change stuff, so we're just going to inject it into the page. We're going to AJAX request it. We're going to inject the HTML you need into the page. And that seems wonderful. It actually performs faster. It's like, great, wonderful. The only problem is, is that if you didn't write your JS, if you didn't write your JavaScript exactly right, in the da -da -da, then you've got this problem where your events aren't being removed. And so there was all this code to remove all of our events for Turbolinks, just for Turbolinks. So we got rid of Turbolinks, and we were able to handle our events much better because Vue takes care of that. You're not adding event listeners, and it's, and it's not uh, that sort of thing. We also had a lot more reusable code. Uh, and the reusable code makes such a much, it makes a much bigger difference because you're writing less code. And so then we had this situation where everybody on our team was writing Vue in these .view files, but everybody was writing it just a little bit differently. And from a maintainer point of view, from someone who's reviewing the code, it's like, how do you say what the right way of doing things is? How do you decide what this right way is? And so we adopted Vuex, and that solved a lot of our problems because we could say, this is the way that they suggest doing it. The documentation is all there. And so from a opinionated and non-opinionated standpoint, we started to need the opinionated stuff because we wanted all of our people who were writing code to write it in the same way so that we could review it easier, which makes the review faster. So here's a uh, typical uh, view component. This is our notes, um, which is our comments. So you open up an issue and you have comments at the bottom. It was originally in this notes.js file that was written in jQuery, or originally in CoffeeScript, and it was a big spaghetti mess. Uh, and so we rewrote all of our comments in Vue. And um, with, the, with the virtual DOM and all of that stuff, it, it actually made our, it, it was the one page where um, suddenly when we replaced that with Vue and we AJAX loaded all of the comments, that page became faster than all the competition. Um, which was kind of amazing. We didn't necessarily know that that was going to happen uh, that quickly. And it was because things are rendering uh, a lot faster. And we, so when you're writing jQuery, one of the things that you're not doing is you're not like, all the things that Vue is doing, taking care of on its own with the DOM and all of these things, you're not thinking about that when you're writing jQuery, or at least you have to put extra effort into that when um, Vue is doing that on its own. So, the other thing is you're looking at this and you're saying this is the typical structure of a Vue X uh, component. Uh, this is a typical structure of our notes. So you can look at this, you see components, mixins, services, and stores, and then you have your um, entry point and your constants. If you go to review this code, it's much easier to review because everything's written in the same way. And we made our docs, and our docs helped other people write docs. And this is the way that we write Vue at GitLab, which might be different than the way that you write Vue, which is OK. But then we could follow this. And when people went to write it, we could say, OK, here's our docs. This is the way that we do it. And so here we are at the present moment, right? We removed CoffeeScript. We switched to ES5. We rewrote some of that ES5 to ES6. We added in Webpack. We write big features in Vue. We don't write everything in Vue, but we write just big features in Vue. And we use Vue Loader for an easier programming situation, a more organized code base, and to increase the performance. And we use Vuex 
uh, for our coding consistency. And so what does the future look like at GitLab with Vue? Right now we have reusable components, but it's that situation where you start in a code base that's already written and you're not rewriting everything from scratch, so you're not going to have all perfectly neat, tidy, reusable components, especially when you're still trying to move forward here. So we're going into this process of creating reusable components, but there's a problem. Our CSS was not written in such a way to be reusable, and the CSS and Vue go hand in hand. Both need to be reusable. So our styles are not 100% consistent. And this is a problem that uh, is solved with post CSS and Vue Loader, but it's solved with some caveats for us. It's like, great, let's create a reusable component. Let's build a button component. And so, you know, you got your style tag and you've got your template, and when it's compiled, it compiles into this very unique uh, data attribute, and that works perfectly. But the problem is, is that GitLab is not 100% Vue.js. It might not ever be 100% uh, Vue.js. Okay, there we go. And so we needed two approaches. We needed that approach where components existed only in Vue. So there's gonna be that situation where we write a component and it exists only in Vue. It's not being reused anywhere else outside of Vue. And we need that situation where components exist inside of Vue and outside of Vue. And so we created this thing called CSS Lab, and you're thinking, no, not another framework. Don't you dare write another framework. Um, it's not another framework. <laughs> it's actually just the process that everybody follows when they put some sort of CSS framework in their code, and then they start writing code on top of that. This is just an organized way to do that. So we use Bootstrap 3 as a base, and we're just overriding the styles, and this is just an organized way to override those styles. It's an organized way to fit Bootstrap into GitLab, so why not make it official and give it a name and say we're gonna follow certain conventions when we do this from now on. So it follows all of the Bootstrap conventions, which are really, really great, and it's just basically Bootstrap and GitLab with great conventions. And you say, what about Bootstrap 4? Well, again, remember, boring solutions. Uh, we have a lot of Bootstrap 3, we gotta reuse, we gotta iterate, and we gotta go with boring solutions. So we have the view component and we have the CSS component, which are two separate things. If you've ever looked at the Bootstrap docs, they have a thing that says components. And that's what I'm talking about when I say components. And you know about the view component. So the CSS component, the way we organize it, is similar to the way that we organize our view components, each inside its own directory. So you might have the button directory, and in there, in the CSS, make sure that we separate the skin, the layout, and the variables, and sometimes we have a mix-in in there. And so let's take a look at our skin. It contains only the colors, it's got the border, it's got the colors, anything having to do with the skin of the button. If you took it away, the button would still work, it just wouldn't have a skin. Then you have your variables, and so that you're not hard coding any values in your CSS. And you notice that some of these variables go to other variables, which is in our base.scss, so that we're not redefining the white color over and over again. Not that that's very difficult, but you wouldn't want somebody to mess that up. Um, and then we also have in that base all of our different colors defined so that people don't go outside of our color palette. So we have uh, gray 200 to 950, something like that. And then you have the view component. And so when you look at the view component, uh, the most important thing here is at the bottom, which is our template. And the template, we're not using the style tag here. Instead, we're just applying the class because this view component, the styles are used outside of the view component as well, like a button. We have buttons on static pages. We have buttons in our settings, and the settings aren't written in view. And so here's this class that just has uh, animation container. And so this is actually, um, this one's actually our um, skeleton loader is what we call it, which is like when comments are loading, you got that thing that looks like blurred comments that loads? Yeah, that thing. 
Uh, so we wrote it as a view component, um, but it's actually being used outside of Vue as well. And until, you know, GitLab is catacombs of features and all these things, so we can't just, again, rewrite everything. So we need it to be in both places. So we have uh, a class in there, and then we can also apply the class dynamically, but we still have a class. So that's when components exist inside and outside of Vue, and when they exist only in Vue, we use the style tags because it provides huge performance boosts. And so here's our uh, situation where we have a component that uses style tags. And you can see we have the style tags in there, we have Flexbox, and when that gets compiled, big performance boosts. And so we use the style tags for performance. And so the most important thing is that we started at GitLab with jQuery, we started with CoffeeScript, and we started with inline JavaScript. And where we ended was with Vue, Webpack, Vue Loader, and Vuex. But that's not the real story because that was not our main goal. Our real story is that we started with a lengthy, annoying development experience. And when we saw that development experience, we said, we can make this better. And we ended with a quicker, more pleasant development experience. And that is the most important thing to get from all this. It's not that you're using the latest, greatest framework. It's that you want to make the most pleasant, easiest development experience. Thank you very much.